Well, we're in Romans 10 if you want to, uh, to turn there. And um, I'm going to uh, teach like Jesus taught this morning. That is, I'm going to sit down. I kind of tweaked my back yesterday. I'm doing much better, but um, hey, why push it? You know what I mean? So uh, the, uh decided to, I'm going to sit this one out. All right, we're in Romans 10, uh, uh, Romans four, uh, uh, verse 14 to 21. Uh, so the title of the message is a message that requires uh, beautiful feet. And uh, you know, some of you think, well, I'm hopeless in that category. I got a luau feet, not beautiful feet. But uh, again, this is a reference that uh, Paul will use where he pulls from two Old Testament passages uh, like he's done many times in this epistle and then applies it to uh, certainly the... Uh, uh, his readers in the first century there in Rome up to this point in time, primarily Jewish. He's going to turn to his Gentile audience. We'll kind of get there a little bit towards the end of uh, chapter 10, and then he'll turn and really direct to them uh, specifically uh, in chapter uh, 11. But uh, he's going to make reference to the fact that there's a, there's a message that must go out, and whoever delivers it then has beautiful feet. Now, last week we looked at the message, and the message is of critical importance in terms of, of the content. Because basically, he's going to tell us and give us what I think is uh, some real insight in how people get saved. Uh, and what's required is for them to hear a particular message. Not just a good message about God, not just a great Bible story from the Bible, but people only get saved by hearing that confession that we uh, looked at last week. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. But we kind of took that apart and said, the, con the confession is this, in Paul's eyes, in his first century writing, and we uh, tried to do the best to spell that out for us, is that when he says that Jesus is Lord, he means he's God Almighty. Uh, can a person get saved and not believe that Jesus is God? No, they can't, according to the Bible, according to the Apostle Paul. Uh, he also said, described that, that God left heaven, Jesus, and came to earth, the incarnation. That's necessary as well. Talked about him going to death, conquering death, and coming back from the other side. Made reference to the uh, abyss. Uh, it's necessary for a person to believe that Jesus was God Almighty, that he left heaven, that he died on a Roman cross, that he uh, conquered death, and, and uh, physically, bodily resurrected from the dead. If we place our faith in him, then we'll be saved. And if that, it's all or nothing. It's the whole package. Can you get saved because you think Jesus was a wonderful teacher? No, you can't. Uh, can you get saved because you think that maybe he died on a cross, but you're not sure about this God thing? No, you can't, according to the Bible, according to the Apostle Paul. Anyway, so we kind of explored that, kind of broke that down. Very important uh, because it plays a role uh, in what he deals with here. Uh, we said the confession uh, had those uh, elements. Uh, we said that it was personal, and it came with this wonderful promise. Uh, at the end of our text last week where he quotes Isaiah 28 and says, the one who trusts will never be dismayed. Then he quotes Joel 2, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord uh, will be saved. So that's the confession, and now he's going to deal with, now how can people get saved? Well, they've got to be able to hear the message, and that message in particular, and he says the person that delivers that message has beautiful feet. We'll give you the historical context of where those words come from. But it, it brings to mind the story of Lauren Cunningham. Lauren Cunningham was a founder with Youth with a Mission, uh, and I couldn't find my little book, uh, When God Calls, or uh, I can't even really remember the title, but it's his little biography about his own life a little bit. Uh, and in teaching through his own life, he gives you these principles about how to know God's will and be in God's will and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and he tells the story of when he was uh, uh, just a little guy, uh, and, uh, and God really spoke to his heart uh, about going into the ministry, uh, being an evangelist, and so forth. And this is uh, in the 30s. Times were uh, very tough. Uh, and uh, he had something happen to him then that had never happened to him before. And that is, as he shared this news with his mother, with his dad, his mom said, Well, son, we want to mark this occasion. Uh, this is something you'll never want to forget. God speaking to you in this way, calling you to be someone who would deliver this message that, uh, that we've just spoken about. So she took him downtown, rode the bus, took him downtown, went into a shoe store, and for the first time in his life, he got a brand new pair of shoes because everything was uh, the older brothers right, right on down. And he got a brand new pair of shoes the first time in his life, and she told him, 
I want you to remember this always, that you have beautiful feet. <laughs> and remember that God's calling you to deliver a, a message of peace uh, and a message of glad tithings. And she read these verses to him. Uh, anyway, uh, hopefully we'll all have beautiful feet when we leave here today. Let's look at verse 14. The message of the Messiah requires a, a messenger. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him, him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So uh, the obvious here, for people to get saved, it requires a preacher. Now, uh, that's the word that's used here. Maybe a better translation would be messenger, because it's not the word apostle. It's just simply a word that's normally translated messenger. In other words, this isn't the professional. People don't get saved because a professional preacher, the professional evangelist, goes out and shares this message. In fact, very few people get saved that way. Big events, big crusades are wonderful things. We love uh, what uh, God is doing through uh, Greg Laurie and uh, uh, the Harvest uh, Crusades and so forth. <clears throat> Franklin Graham and what he's doing uh, for the body of Christ and everything. But that's a very small percentage. Most people are going to hear this message from you guys, basically. There's a lot of people that will never darken the doorway of a church, uh, but they'll, they'll listen to you uh, in the appropriate setting uh, out there in, in the community. So it, the messenger uh, is simply the one delivering uh, the word. Secondly, it requires someone uh, being sent. That's very obvious as he quotes uh, Isaiah, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel uh, of peace. And, uh, and again, two different historical contexts. Paul's drawing from a verse that uh, is, uh, is quoting from Nahum and also Isaiah. The Nahum quote is interesting. How is that referenced as, uh, as beautiful feet? Well, you're probably more familiar with Jonah than you are Nahum. Both kind of had the same message, both to the same group of people. You remember Jonah, God calls him to go to Nineveh and, uh, and tell them to repent or judgment uh, is coming. Uh, and when we went through that, and we made reference to Jonah, if uh, we understand what was going on in his world at that time, we understand a little bit, have at least some empathy for why he went the opposite direction. The Assyrians, those of uh, there in Nineveh, <laughs> were incredible in terms of their art, their art architecture, the sophistication of their society in many ways, but they were absolutely the most cruel people that have probably ever been on the planet. They constantly thought of ways of torturing people so they could in inflict the most pain without actually killing the individual so that it would be a process that would go on for several days. They literally skinned people alive. That's not just a figure of speech. These guys did it. According to their own artwork and we've seen in the reliefs and so forth uh, from that part of the world and we have it recorded in other documents as well. <clears throat> when, they, when they captured people they would actually take what looks like a big Hawaiian fish hook and they would put it through the lip or through the nose and that's how they hooked them together. Of course, they were bound as well, but uh, very tough to escape when you've got a hook uh, right through your lip. Uh, it was so bad that when they would invade towns in northern Israel and they had them surrounded, on occasion, the entire town or village would commit mass suicide rather than be captured by these guys. So. Jonah, Jonah gets the message. There's already been a prophecy that God is going to judge them because they're so wicked. And they're like, yeah. And uh, so when Jonah gets the message, go and preach. Uh, uh, they should repent or, or judgment is coming. Uh, he doesn't want to go because he wants judgment to come. He was from northern Israel. It may have been some of his own family members that have already been tortured and killed by these guys. So these guys... Uh, up there, we might call them the Taliban of the day. Uh, they're up there, and Jonah does not want to go up there and preach the good news to them. Uh, so he's like, thank you, Lord. That's a good suggestion. Find somebody else. I'm out of here, right? He boards the ship. You remember the rest of Jonah. He does, makes it up there, and they repent. So God brings a revival to the most wicked people that maybe ever uh, lived on the planet, and probably one of the greatest revivals uh, in the history of the world. That goes for 150 years. 150 years, a guy named Nahum, another prophet comes along. God says, uh, go let them know time's up. Because that generation did repent, but not the next one, not the next one, not the next one. 
And God says it's time. So Nahum goes to deliver the word, comes back. God is going to judge uh, the Assyrian kingdom. And people go, you got beautiful feet, man. I love that. That's, that's the idea. That's the idea of the beautiful feet. That's good news. So that's, that's one of the historical settings. Now, the other one is from uh, Isaiah. Isaiah is prophesying a time in the future when the Messiah will come and establish his kingdom on earth, what we call the Messianic kingdom of Jesus Christ, the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ that he will come and establish. Isaiah is talking about it and saying, and our God will reign. And the people said, you got beautiful feet, man. I love that message. Paul pulls those and says, when you go deliver the gospel, that's a gospel of peace and glad tidings, not everybody, you'll mention that, not everybody, they're all going to people saying, that is really good news. That is exactly what I needed to hear. You got beautiful feet, man. Uh, that's the idea. That's the historical setting. And Paul so beautifully is, uh, is the great scholar. He what, is, is able to constantly draw from these Old Testament passages. Again, he does that because he's writing primarily to uh, a Jewish audience. So uh, the, the message requires a messenger. Uh, the message requires someone being uh, sent. That implies there's someone sending them. <laughs> there's someone sending them, a group of people that are sending them. So there's an obligation, certainly, even today, that all of us are sent uh, to deliver the message that some are going to reject. Other people are, are going to go, that's exactly what I needed to hear. That is a great message. Thank you for delivering it. Uh, but it also implies that we need to be involved in sending other people uh, in other places around the, uh, the world. Again, uh, we, uh, our missions board, we've got the, uh, the reference to uh, uh, the great suggestion by Jesus. I think that was the great com uh, commission by Jesus to, to go into uh, to all the world. So this becomes a great uh, missionary uh, passage as well. Now, the Apostle Paul was somebody that knew that. He was certainly a great teacher, a great pastor, but, but he was a missionary as well. Uh, and uh, he understood the need to be sent. Now, for himself, you know what he did is he was a tent maker. Uh, they, uh, again, uh, in, in that day within Judaism, it uh, doesn't matter what kind of education you got. Your father always taught you a trade. You know, when I was growing up, my dad was in the grocery business. He made sure we knew the grocery business. Wherever we went, we could get a job. Go to college, do the best you can. You got a little fall back here. Everybody learned a trade. And I've uh, kind of lost that, of course, uh, over the generations. But, uh, but Paul had it. His father had taught him to be a tent maker. He'd studied at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the great rabbis of, uh, uh, of all time within Judaism. But when he went out to the mission field, he could support himself because he never wanted money to be an issue. Uh, when he's out preaching, people have never heard the name of Jesus before. He worked so hard, we know from the book of Acts and so long, he not only supported himself, he supported some of the guys that were with him. Uh, that were uh, part of his whole uh, entourage. Guys, he was discipling, helping in the ministry. But we know from his letter to the church at Philippi that, that as they began and others began to send and support him to be the senders of the Apostle Paul, uh, that when he had the finances, then, man, he went full-time uh, in the ministry, uh, redeeming the time, being able to do more for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says to those group of people, and Philippians 4.19, he says to them that are supporting missions, he says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Again, uh, sometimes I think we kind of look at that. We love the verse. We kind of make a broad appeal or broad application. But read it for yourself. It's in the context of Paul thanking them for supporting him in his missionary endeavors. And he says, Because you've supported me in this endeavor... Even though it may have been a sacrifice to you, don't worry because God will meet all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Now again, this idea of sending actually comes right from Jesus himself. I just want to go through and just to help us see the obvious here and what's involved in being sent as well as sending. What's the purpose in it? It's very clear from the words of Jesus. In John 20... Jesus has already had his death, his resurrection. He's with the disciples uh, once again. Verse 21 says, So Jesus said to them, Shalom, or peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Uh, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now at that point, the apostles are 
born again of God's Spirit. When uh, Jesus breathes on you so that you get the Holy Spirit, I think you get it. Uh, and of course, we see them in a subsequent uh, day, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they're baptized in the Holy Spirit to be witnesses, both Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts. So two, two different works of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but our point in here is Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Uh, in Luke 19.10, he tells us exactly how the Father sent him. Uh, he there says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. I know this is pretty simple and pretty basic, but God sent Jesus into this world to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus sent his followers then into the world to seek and to save uh, that which is lost. Therefore, all of us should have luau feet, beautiful feet, because uh, he has sent all of us as his followers to seek and to save that which is lost. How do we do that? Well, Again, we build friendships with people and so forth to get to know them. We want to listen to them. We want to hear their stories. We want to hear their objections to Christianity and meet those objections. We want to give them reasons for faith and so forth. But ultimately, nobody can get saved unless they hear the message. And uh, they can't hear the message uh, unless someone is sent. Therefore, all of us, in a sense, are sent to those around us. Uh, but uh, And all of us should be part of sending in terms of, uh, uh, of others. And I'll tell you a little bit of how you can uh, do that here at the end of the message just to make things a little more practical. So uh, it re for people to get saved, it requires a messenger. Uh, they must be sent. It implies there's somebody sending them, supporting them. Uh, and three, it requires a message of peace. Uh, verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach. Notice it's a gospel of peace who bring glad tidings of good things. And as I said earlier, in the historical setting of whether it's Nahum or, uh, or Isaiah, both the reception of you've got beautiful feet was because that was really good news. I mean, for very different reasons on both occasions. Uh, but Paul says uh, that's, uh, that is the, uh, the indication of what it should be for us. But it doesn't happen unless they're sent it doesn't happen unless someone can hear. We're going to look at uh, verse 17 very carefully here in a moment and help you see that. Unless the message is the right message, the seeds of the gospel can't get planted and people literally can't get saved. Therefore, it's very important that those that are sent are actually seeking to save that which is lost and delivering the message. Now, for example, one statistic that missionologists study and kind of I marveled at is that today, currently, half of the missionaries around the world no longer preach the gospel. They don't preach this message. They might be doing wonderful things. They might be working with uh, uh, kids that have uh, AIDS in Africa, uh, that so many are. They might be doing uh, educational things, uh, medical clinics, uh, a, number, a number of things. Uh, all good, very good things. Things that can be used as a platform for actually sharing the gospel, but some groups have been at it so long helping for so long, they actually no longer preach the message. So what they're doing is a very good thing, uh, but knowing nobody is going to heaven uh, as a result. When we first started uh, <coughs> the church uh, in the fall of 1989, shortly after that, we sent our first missions, missionaries out long term. One of them was uh, uh, that's uh, still serving with us, uh, Von and Isabel Heckman, uh, and they went to uh, Pakistan uh, at that time, and they were there for a number of times. Uh, and you know they have uh, uh, another ministry that uh, is uh, in another Muslim country. Uh, if you want to know more about that, you can uh, ask me uh, later. But uh, uh, we sent them out, uh, and then we also sent Kay Hansen. Kay Hansen was a nurse here. Uh, she was uh, our daughter's only Sunday school teacher that uh, rode a motorcycle and jumped out of airplanes. And uh, so she was, uh, uh, you know, she was a nurse, and she wanted to serve the Lord and. Uh, she could go to a place like Thailand and uh, survive there, no problem. And while she was there, God gave her a real heart for the Khmer people. All, all of those that had fled because of the Khmer Rouge and uh, made it across the border and were living in, uh, in refugee camps. Again, historically, if you don't know, that's a result of our pulling out of Vietnam, the communists rushing in, slaughtering the people there. That spreads into Cambodia, what we call the killing fields, and today there's the uh, monuments of, of stacked up uh, bones and skulls that are the testimony uh, of what happens when there is lawlessness 
uh, in a place. It becomes a country of widows because most of the men are gone. She has a heart for these folks. She's uh, with uh, kind of a group that's more short term. She comes back, uh, finds someone here that can learn to teach her to speak the language, starts preparing, and now she wants to apply. This is organizations that are really uh, designed public health kinds of things, long term uh, 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 missionary plants, and, uh, and be there for a number of years. But she wants to make sure they're preaching the gospel, that whatever else they're doing, that's the primary focus. She had a little bit of a hard time. She met some wonderful groups, but if, if you have time, you, it's okay if you share the gospel, but it wasn't their main focus. She finally found one, and she went, and she was there for a, a number of years, and uh, God really used her. And She established uh, some wonderful uh, public health programs that ended up getting modeled all over the country and even some other places uh, in, uh, in Asia that were saving lots of uh, children's lives uh, because of a few basic precautions and so forth. But a lot of people heard the gospel. A lot of people got saved uh, as, as a result. People aren't going to get saved unless there's a messenger, and the messenger has got to be on track with the, with the right message. And we'd say, fourth, that it requires a response. How can they call on the Messiah, on Jesus, unless they uh, have believed in him? Look at verse 14 again. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed How uh, shall they believe in uh, him of whom they have not heard? Two central issues here. What we believe about Jesus Christ is critical. So does it matter if somebody waters down the gospel? Yeah, apparently it really matters. What if they they don't want to deal with the deity of Christ? What if they don't want to say the word sin? Because that might offend somebody. There there are whole groups across the country talking about... uh, thousands and thousands of people that are hearing a gospel that is not the one prescribed in the Bible by the Apostle Paul here. And according to him, as we'll see in verse 17, you, you can't get there. You know, you, it's, it's the seeds of the gospel, the truth itself, that actually bring faith uh, to our own hearts. Uh, again, the other issue is uh, uh, believing precludes uh, the calling. I've got to hear the message I've got to then believe so that I'll call. If I call, I get saved. But the believing comes first, and it can't happen unless I hear the gospel. Verse 16, the message of the Messiah must be received by faith. Again, these are very familiar verses to many of us. For they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who's believed our report? So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So not everybody's going to receive the message. Now, again, Paul's dealing with the big issues uh, of his hearers uh, that, uh, that day in the first century is that has God's plan failed? I mean, God's plan was bring the Messiah, bring him to the nation of Israel. He's the king of the nation. Uh, they reject him. They reject the Messiah. Man, what happens now? Does God's plan fail? No, it hasn't failed. In fact, Paul has gone through and said, hey, you know what? God's going to have mercy on whom he has mercy. Uh, God, remember the example of Hosea, God is able to bring judgment on those 10 tribes of the nation of Israel, judge them, but save individuals out of them. He says he's doing that today. Yes, judgment is coming. It will come because of the rejection of the Messiah, but he's still saving individuals out of it. God's plan hasn't failed. And that's been part of what we've looked at over the last couple of three weeks. So, hey, are some people going to reject the message? Yeah, some are going to reject the message. And to prove that, and pr- prove that that should have been anticipated, he quotes Isaiah 53.1. You know, who's uh, uh, believed our message? To whom are the, uh, has the arm of the Lord been revealed? His strength, his power uh, has been revealed to the Israel, to the Jewish people. But as a nation, they've, uh, they've rejected it. Uh, it was true in, uh, in, uh, in Isaiah's day. Uh, it's true in Paul's day. Now, this verse is also quoted in John's gospel. And I want to read the context of that because it helps us understand another reason why sometimes people don't place their faith uh, in Jesus Christ. There in John 12, verse 37, it says, But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? There's the quote again. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I would heal them. 
These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Spoke of the Messiah, Jesus. Verse, verse 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, synagogue rulers of that day, many believed in him, in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, excommunicated. Uh, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. You've got people that are synagogue rulers. They know the scriptures. They've heard the message. And they don't believe. Why don't they believe? Because of their position. What other people might say. Uh, because of the cultural setting that, that they're in. What would happen within their family? And they consider all of these things. And they determine not to believe in Jesus. And Paul says, well, that's what Isaiah says. Not everybody's going to believe the message. It was true in Paul's day. Certainly it's true in our day as well. But that shouldn't stop us from delivering the message. Because in reality, it's a message of peace. It's a message that, uh, that people should listen to and go, man, I can be forgiven of all of my sins, past, present, and future, go to heaven for all eternity, never fear death. What do I got to do? What must I do to be saved? You know, when you think about it, once you know Christ, it's kind of like, okay, why didn't I kind of get this a little sooner here? I mean, what, what was going on up here in this little thick, thick pea brain uh, rattling around between my ears? Why didn't I catch this sooner? I don't know what I was thinking, but uh, not everyone is going to believe. Uh, secondly, the message must be received by faith. Verse 17, perhaps one of the most uh, misquoted verses uh, in the New Testament, and I'll show you why. Uh, verse 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, usually you hear that quoted uh, uh, well, I'm just really struggling in my faith. Well, brother, you need to get into the Word. You know, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You know, that's probably true. You know, get into the Bible, read God's Word, let Him speak to you. But that's not what this verse is saying. Uh, this verse has uh, actually nothing to do with that at all. It has everything to do with salvation and salvation only. Let me kind of break it apart for you. He starts by saying, so then. It's kind of like a word or a phrase like, therefore. Based on everything that we've said, which would include for us everything we studied last Sunday as well as this Sunday. Here's this message, very explicit, uh, and uh, not everybody's going to receive it, but those that do are going to get saved. Therefore, again, the next words in the verse say, uh, the word of faith. Faith comes by hearing. The word of faith. Uh, there is a definite article that's in the Greek that's not in our English uh, uh, Bibles. I don't know why. Nobody checked with me. But uh, it's not there. It should be the faith. So the faith comes by hearing. What's the faith? Salvation. Everything we've been talking about. Therefore, what we've said so far, this confession that Jesus is God, that he died on a cross, that he rose again, these essentials uh, of, the, of the gospel itself, that faith is what people uh, need to, to hear. Uh, again, in the hearing, literally, comes by hearing or out of hearing. Uh, so out of hearing the gospel message, the faith, the message of the faith, uh, then people are saved. When he says it's the word of God, again, he could have used one of two words. He could have used logos, which means God's written word or God's word uh, uh, in its entirety. But he uses rhema. And we said a good definition for that was simply some, you could say God's spoken word, or you could say a spoken specific word for a specific uh, situation. Uh, therefore, there's two things that we learn from this verse is that the source from which saving faith comes, comes from hearing the gospel itself. Uh, a person could not have faith at all. Please understand. They could not hear, have faith at all. And they hear the gospel. The seeds of the gospel are planted within them. Now they believe and now they can call on the Lord and now they get saved. The gospel is very powerful. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God into salvation for those who believe. Uh, and sometimes I think, I mean, you know, we experience it. We get saved and we forget that. You mean my just telling somebody those words could just totally lead to them getting saved? Even though 30 seconds before that, they could have told me they could care less about church, Jesus Christ, or anything else. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's what Paul is saying here. In the gospel message itself is the power of, to actually cause a person to call out to believe and to be saved. Sir, are we helping anybody when we water down the message? We're not helping anybody. We're actually probably preventing them from getting saved. 
Now they might get saved through someone else here and somewhere else or whatever. And I'm not saying that every, every person you meet, you know, do you believe that Jesus is God? You, you know, you, it's not to, to beat somebody on the head with the, the biggest King James Bible you got or whatever. Uh, it's not that at all. But uh, certainly when there's an opportunity, when, you know, the timing is right, when there, you know, the person is open to sitting down for more than 30 seconds with you to talk about something spiritual and you can get the conversation from what we call small talk to big talk. You know, Jesus with the well, the woman at the Samaritan well, uh, she was talking about water and getting the water and he's able to get from water to, to who he really is in terms of the Messiah. Uh, if we can get from small talk to big talk, we need to be able to deliver the goods, the message that then can penetrate their own souls so they can believe and so they can call on the name of the Lord. Uh, you can tell I get a little excited about this uh, because I, I don't know why. I shouldn't be amazed. I've been doing this for a long time, but I'm still amazed when people get saved. You know, it's just amazing, you know. It's just, you know, I, I, just like I'm saying, you could care less, whatever. You just say the words and like all of a sudden, yeah, they just respond. They want to get saved. It's like, wow, you should do this more often. You know, it just always occurs to me. Why don't I do this more often? You know, it's, a, it's amazing. Uh, the second thing we need to kind of pull from this passage is uh, what I'm to believe has got to come from the word of God. It's got to come from the word of God. Uh, I, can't, I can't make it up uh, as, uh, as I go along. And, you know, I mean, you know, uh, we all talk in different styles. It doesn't matter if you deliver the gospel in pidgin or some other language. You know, but it's got to have the same content to, uh, uh, to what Paul's message is here. Uh, I want to show you one cross-reference in 1 Peter 1.22 where he's talking about this idea of how we get saved. I think it'll kind of help uh, add a little insight. I've alluded to some of the wording of it already. 1 Peter 1.22, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently uh, with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. How were people born again? Through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. What is it like? Because all flesh uh, is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers, flowers falls away. But in contrast to that, but the word of the, Lord, of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. How are people saved? They are born again. Of corruptible seed? No, incorruptible. It's through the word of God. People are saved through this, this message found in, in the word of God. Uh, and again, uh, this can sound so simple, but I think that we just forget it uh, at, uh, at times. We don't really understand even what's going on or how it uh, operates. I don't think we, in a sense, we place enough faith in the gospel itself and the power it has to actually convert a person and, uh, and, uh, and save a person. And I think sometimes we're, uh, we're just kind of waiting a long time to pull the trigger, so, so to speak, in terms of, you know, uh, I, I just... <laughs> It's like they almost have to say, what must I do to be saved, you know, before we finally uh, actually give them the gospel. And, and I think this should encourage us to, uh, to say those words maybe a, a little bit uh, uh, sooner. Again, we never want to minimize uh, missionary outreach of the church. Uh, the passage here, Paul's talking about Israel, why they weren't saved. Uh, but it applies to everybody. Uh, and therefore, it says that all of us should be able to have beautiful feet. Uh, and we certainly should be supporting those that are out there uh, in the rest of the world uh, doing what they're doing, messengers for the kingdom that have beautiful feet uh, as well. So the message requires a messenger. It's got to be received by faith. Uh, and as I mentioned here in verse 18, well, sometimes it's going to be rejected. There Paul says, but I say, have they, the nation of Israel, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth <coughs> and their words to the ends of the world. Someone might argue with the Apostle Paul. How do you know Israel really hurt? I mean, you know, I mean, they're waiting for the Messiah, the Messiah comes, and man, they just don't seem to get it. Are you sure they really heard? <laughs> well, pretty sure, pretty sure. And then he quotes Psalm 19. Now I'm gonna read Psalm 19. We're kind of mostly familiar with Psalm 19, a lot of us. But then he grabs verse four and applies it to their given situation. Here's Psalm uh, 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the fir firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. Night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, 
and their words to the ends of the world. Doesn't matter where you are, uh, doesn't matter what continent you're on, wherever you're at, everybody can look up, everybody can see the skies, they can see the constellations, they can see the, the movement, they can understand there is a design, there is a creator, and they can know one thing is that Whoever made all this is bigger than and lives outside, so he's not limited to time space because he had to be outside of it to create it. And you could know certain things about God, his power, his majesty, that he's eternal and so forth. And Paul quotes a portion of that and applies it to Israel. Are you sure they heard? <laughs> Pretty sure. Pretty sure. Because they, everybody's got that. But they not only had that, they had the word of God itself. One writer said they had the book of nature and the book of Revelation. In other words, they had God's revealed word as well as being able to see. Yeah, pretty sure they heard. Paul put it this way uh, back in Romans 1, dealing with why everybody will be accountable to God one day. Verse 18 of chapter 1, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest, is made known uh, in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts became darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made to look like corruptible man birds and four-footed animals and geckos. I threw the geckos that says creepy things. I throw them in with creepy things. Maybe other <laughs> creepy things as well. And uh, again, uh, they might get you a good deal in shirts, uh, but don't worship one. The, uh, uh, but Paul is saying that everybody's got a shot at it. And, uh, and everybody's without excuse uh, because of creation itself. So the answer is, are you sure they heard? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they heard because they had the, the book of nature as well as the book of Revelation. Not everybody is going to receive the gospel when it's delivered, whether it's by us or somebody cross-culturally. Some are going to reject it. Israel as a nation rejected it, but out of that nation, God in his grace still saved Jews as he's continuing to today. Is it God rejected the nation then? No, not at all. And he's going to talk about that future for them uh, in chapter uh, 11 when we get to that message. It requires a, a messenger, it's received by faith, it's rejected, but the message of the Messiah has been revealed as well. And uh, we're real glad who it's been revealed too. Verse 19, but I say that Israel not know, for Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. It's talking about us, by the way. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was manifest, showed himself to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. That's us he's talking about here. There's Jews and there's Gentiles. Just like, so, so when he talks about uh, those that are not a nation, uh, it's the rest of the people in the world. Uh, the foolish nation, that's the rest of the people in the world. People that didn't seek him, uh, that's everybody else. People that didn't ask for him, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, everybody else. And he's saying that this is the grace of God. Yes, as a nation, Israel rejected their Messiah. God is still saving individuals out of that nation. He has a plan for the nation uh, in the future, and we'll see God's grace in that. But because of that rejection, the gospel now has gone out to the rest of the world. That's the other issue, right? They were kind of sure. Uh, how do these Gentiles get in here? What's, go, what's going on? What's up with this? And you say it's because the nation rejected the gospel now who's gone to everybody else. Uh, and uh, in, unless you're Jewish, I'd say, uh, amen. We're pretty glad that that, that, that happened. And, and uh, so that's the grace of God. And Paul says, and the grace in it is, is for Israel as well. Because two things are going to happen. One, they get ticked off. They get angry. And, and there, they were in the first century. Uh, if you read the book of Acts uh, and read some of the epistles, there's a few Jewish people that are ticked off at the Apostle Paul, aren't they? They're kind of hunting the guy down. You know, persecute that guy. That's a bad guy. Look what he's doing here. Anger. What's the other thing? Jealousy. Jealousy. Look what they have. Wait, 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 wait. We follow the Torah. Man, we eat kosher. We do this. We do all this stuff. And those guys know the Lord. Those guys have eternal life. 
Those guys have a relationship with the Lord. Those guys call on the Lord. God answers. Why don't we have that? You probably have a friend that's been jealous before. I know none of you have ever been jealous, but you probably have a friend that's been jealous before. And that's what, and you understand it. It's like, wow, are you kidding me? They got the promotion? Are you kidding me? They have that car? Are you kidding me? They, whatever it might be. But uh, he's saying, that's Israel. And by God's grace, he can actually draw them to himself, even though they've rejected the gospel as, as, as a nation. And he quotes to prove it. He quotes uh, uh, Moses, Deuteronomy 32, prophesying uh, that in the future, Israel would rebel against God. Uh, and, uh, and they would be angry and jealous uh, when it went out to, uh, to the Gentiles. Uh, and then the prophet Isaiah predicted that too in Isaiah 65, 1. Now, the second thing about the revealing to the Gentiles is never change the heart of God for the Jewish people. That's certainly going to be the theme that he runs into in chapter 11. But very, very uh, beautiful passage here. All day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. And, and, and God's not going to go in, and I've had it up to here. No, he, see, he doesn't. He just says, I'm still stretching out my arms. Yep, you're disobedient. Yeah, you're contrary. You didn't receive the Messiah, but I'm not giving up on you. I'm not giving up on you as a people. I'm not giving up on you as a nation. I'm just going to keep stretching out my arms as long as I have to until you come to know me. And they will in the future. And certainly that's Paul. Paul's whole theme uh, as we get to it in, uh, in chapter 11. Hey, I'm so excited. Let's just go right on into chapter 11. What do you think? No, maybe we'll wait for next week. Just seeing if you're still awake there. A couple of things just to kind of wrap this up. Uh, the message requires a, a messenger. And, uh, and God calls us all to deliver this very simple message. That's, you know what? There's nothing more exciting when somebody does see it as a message of peace and, and glad tidings. And they may not say to you, Man, you got beautiful feet. But they might say, I, yeah, I would like to pray that prayer. You know, because it's very simple. You just share it and, hey, would you like to pray to receive the Lord? So sometimes you share the gospel and we never, we never even give them a chance to respond. Would you like to pray to receive the Lord? Yeah, you'd be amazed. Uh, I, I'm amazed. You know, how many times did they go, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, let's, let's pray here. You can tell I have a lot of faith when I'm out, uh, you know, just uh, witnessing the stuff. But don't let that stop you. Don't let that stop you. Because the power is not in you anyway. And it's not in your faith either. You can't have enough faith to get somebody else saved. It's the message. The message is what saves them. And I think that's what we want to kind of take home here. Secondly, the message of the Messiah uh, has got to be received by faith. And so we've got to give them the right message. We've got to give them the whole deal. It doesn't help us to water down the message. Yes, Jesus died for your sins. Are you calling me a sinner? <laughs> well, no, but the Bible is. It means you're not perfect. You, you got any friends that want to back you up on the perfect deal? I think we can settle this issue real quick here. Just check with the guy next to you. You're not perfect. Everybody has sinned to come short of the glory of God. By the way, you're without excuse because God's revealed himself in creation. Uh, you know, so uh, to share the message, it's a message that saves it. Yeah, rejected by the nation. But God certainly is not done with Israel. In fact, he's used it to reveal the gospel to the rest uh, of the world. And I just want to encourage you. I was just talking uh, with folks uh, between uh, services, and I kind of shared this, is that uh, we, we've got uh, you know, a little missionary wall back there, all the missionaries that we support and so forth. And as much as I, I want to say that we all need to be uh, uh, sent uh, with the message to seek and save that which is lost, uh, we certainly need to be supporting those. Uh, why? Well, you know, again, there are some uh, church structures where uh, they just uh, take a percentage off the top. They send it to a missions board. Mission board kind of de determines who goes to the mission field, and they determine, you know, how much they get, where they're at, and they kind of take care of the whole deal. <clears throat> Calvary Chapel is not like that. Uh, we, you know, God just raises people up. They have a calling on their life, and uh, they just go. <laughs> they just go uh, trusting God uh, in the... Um, uh, Chuck Smith 101 proverb where God guides, God provides, and if God wants them there, he's going to provide uh, for them. But we have an obligation to be praying and to be sending. Uh, and uh, I can't tell you how much it means to folks that are on the mission field because I, I try to get out there and see them and be with them. And uh, 
for them. You know, they know the church is going to kind of give them a check every month to help them out. It's not the whole deal. I mean, uh, we're just kind of playing our, our little part in the whole thing. Uh, but when they, when they get a list, they, they don't see how much, who gave what. They just see somebody gave. Th this family, this family. It's tremendously encouraging to know that some folks they've never even met, they don't even know, send them 10 bucks. That's all I'm talking about. I'm talking a couple of Big Macs here, you know, just uh, 10 bucks or five bucks or whatever uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, it means the world because it means, hey, they haven't forgotten me. Uh, and let me give you an example. Uh, I met uh, Nelson DeHosto when he was still a postman in Kaimuki. Uh, it feels like, uh, you know, he wants to kind of take a break, do something for the Lord. And uh, so he takes sabbatical from his uh, nice federal job there. Uh, in a very nice neighborhood, and uh, uh, he uh, gets a little missions training, heads off, and uh, with another uh, buddy of mine, uh, I mentioned earlier, Vaughn, their, their first uh, thing they did mission-wise is they went to Nepal when it was still illegal, uh, and they uh, would put on 80-pound uh, uh, packs that were basically full of tracks, and they would uh, trek, trek the Himalayas, and uh, sounds pretty good when you're like 22, 23 years old. I'm not sure I'd want to do it today, but uh, uh, and that's what they do. They hike just these high altitudes, just distribute all their tracks, and when uh, when they were gone, get back to Kathmandu. And well, Nelson stayed under that. He went to India, went to other places. He meets Marianne. She, Marianne's uh, Chinese from uh, Malaysia. Uh, they're they're married. Uh, I run into them and in, uh, in India 20 years ago. Uh, they're teaching a little discipleship training school. Not a dime to their name. Nobody even know. It it helps to write once in a while, but. Uh, uh, you know, they're living on somebody's uh, uh, extra bedroom floor, uh, eating, uh, eating at this uh, training base and so forth, just barely getting by, having the time of their life, you know, loving God and what he's doing and everything. I have to pry this stuff out of them. I give them all the rupees I've got in my wallet. At the time I come back, we start supporting them. I go to another church and go, hey, did you know? And I get them a little more support from somebody else. And, and they're good. There's 25 years. They're, they're still out there, man. And, uh, and, uh, in Bangkok and uh, have a tremendous uh, ministry with university students uh, there, for example. And I can just tell you, it's been years since I've seen them, uh, and I know why. It's just, they just can't afford to get a plane ticket and come home. You know what? They don't care. They're just going to serve God. It doesn't matter. I'm just saying, there are missionaries out there that are, that are wonderful folks doing great things for the kingdom of God. They get very little support. They get very, you know what? They don't care. As long as they they get a meal once in a while, they're going to do it. So I just encourage you to be a sender and just, uh, I'm not saying like take every car back there and just pray, not even today, maybe just pray about, Lord, how would you direct this? Either to a person, a family, or a country. Uh, and, uh, and if that's not arranged enough, I can tell you other folks that are out there on, on the mission field. Now, some of the folks, the GFA, Gospel of Frasia guys, uh, they're fully supportive. Uh, uh, just if you get one of those cards, pray for them. Uh, they're fully supported. Uh, Rich Rose, uh, Rich and Candace, and uh, worked at Times Supermarket in Honolulu before I went to the mission field. Just, these are just like regular folks that answer the call of God. Uh, they, God's really blessed them to Fuchu in uh, Japan. They've got these preschool going. They've got like 150 kids. They've got kids coming out of their ears. Uh, coming to faith in Christ, uh, uh, building a church there. They not only have the income to support themselves, but they're, they're supporting like three other families, uh, and, uh, and that's where Josh Takamori uh, is, uh, is working with them. Uh, pray for those guys, but they'll tell you, don't send us anything. We got it. The Lord's taking care of us. But there's other people that do, do have needs. And uh, you'll find <laughs> that as you pray, and their newsletters will become a little more exciting. If, uh, you know, as they say, if you got a dog in the fight, if you're investing in this thing a little bit, it gets a little more exciting to hear what's going on and what's, what the Lord's doing. Again, the implication in the text is we're all, we're all sent, but we, we should be sendors uh, as well. How can people hear the gospel, those words that are like seeds that give them faith so they can call on God? Somebody's got to get sent. And, uh, and that's uh, certainly one of the things uh, that we want to take away practically. God wants to use us, but he wants to use us here uh, at, uh, in your place of influence, but he certainly wants to use us to support others. And I can tell you, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. If you give up those two whoppers this month, 
you know, you'll you'll get well, you'll you'll make it somehow through the month. Is what I'm saying there. You know, it's uh, just a little something uh, where you're investing in somebody else's life uh, will help change yours. And when you get to heaven someday, you're gonna have people come up going, "Hey, thank you, man. I really appreciate that." I bet that happened here. Now I didn't think it would happen until heaven. I've had people up, come up and cry because they recognized me and said, you were in Beijing in 19, da, da, da. I go, yeah, you took Bibles to our church, didn't you? Yes, I did. I saw you, that was my church. Here in Honolulu, and they're crying, I'm crying. And it's just an investment. The, the body of Christ is real big. It's just, that it's just not us American folks here, not just uh, us folks here in Hawaii. It's, it's uh, around the world. And, uh, and it's a wonderful thing to be, to be part of it. I just don't want you to miss out on the blessing of it. I hope you appreciate my, my motivation here.
you are my heart the light of my world you are the fire inside me that gives me the courage to hold when all the mountains are falling and all of our treasures are nothing but ashes and smoke jesus cover me 